All right, everyone, let's get the show started. Welcome to Office Hours. It's March 18th, 2020. My name is Eric Osterman, and I'll be leading the conversation. I'm the CEO and founder of Cloud Posse. We are a DevOps accelerator. We help startups own their infrastructure in record time by building it for you and then showing you the ropes. For those of you new to the call, the format is very informal. My goal is to get your questions answered, so feel free to unmute yourself at any time if you want to jump in and participate. If you're tuning in from our podcast or YouTube channel, you can register for these live and interactive sessions by going to cloudposse.com slash office hours. We host these calls every week. We'll automatically post a recording of this session to the Office Hours channel, as well as follow up with an email so you can share it with your team. If you want to share something in private, just ask and we can temporarily suspend the recording. So with that said, let's kick things off. We have a couple talking points here and another one in the Slack channel. Again, if you haven't joined our Slack team, go to slack.com cloudposse.com, again, slack.cloudposse.com, and you can register and join the Office Hours channel there. So uh, one of the uh, awesome recommendations was from Brian Tai. Uh, if everyone can share some of their work from home tips, um, and I'd like to expand that to maybe some productivity hacks. I'm sure this affects pretty much everyone on the call here today, so uh, I'd like to uh, I'll learn from that. Uh, the other th question that we had, just pulling it up here, was uh, was a very common reoccurring question. I think it comes up almost every office hours, but uh, we learn something new uh, every time. Uh, Pierre asks, uh, he, he'd like to have his uh, monitoring strategy vetted uh, for deploying Prometheus Operator, uh, so we'll get into that. And Dale, let's see here, Dale just posted something. Um, Dale, what's this about? Oh, a beginner's guide for working from home. Awesome. So that's, uh, this is by you actually. Yes. Nice. Okay. Okay. So let's, uh, yeah, let's review that uh, in a second as soon as we uh, first do the first order of business. Any questions today uh, outside of these two talking points that I just brought up? Is there uh, one yeah, I have one actually. All right. Um, have you, has anyone uh, done Kubernetes ingress behind a VPN? Hmm. So like you can't I use done. Let's Encrypt. Um, so we're looking at like, you know, doing a node port service, but everything kind of feels like a hacky thrown together mess. Are you like in a private cloud scenario? Oh, or uh, AWS GovCloud behind a VPN. Gotcha. Yeah, not my area of focus. So, what is what? First of all, what's the problem here? I, I don't, I'm not sure. I'm understanding the the problem. Like, why can't you just use regular? Uh, Nginx ingress uh, in that scenario, and what what's the relationship with the VPN and the ingress? Uh, so, because I'm behind a VPN, Let's Encrypt uh, Cert Manager with Let's Encrypt doesn't work. Gotcha. Because, so automatic because it can't because it can't the... do the automatic verification. Gotcha. Um, so I'm looking at doing a like an application load balancer and terminating TLS using a certificate from ACM. Um, and then I guess doing a, uh, instead of a load balancer type service for the Nginx ingress service, doing a node port type service for the Nginx ingress and pointing the ALB to the port, to the, to the hosts <coughs> on the port that, Nginx ingress is on the node port service, but it feels, it doesn't, it doesn't feel very clean. And I was wondering if anyone else had been like, oh yeah, I've done that. And this, this is a much better way to do it. Can you explain Can you the problem with the, the certs again? Why you can't yeah. The... So cert manager um, automatically goes up to let's encrypt and, and does the certification, um, the certificate generation using let's encrypt. And the way Let's Encrypt, um, the way Let's Encrypt validates that you are the owner of the particular domain that you're trying to get a cert for, is Cert Manager deploys a pod that 
publishes an HTTP endpoint that Let's Encrypt then goes and looks at, and it's got some token or whatever. And uh, it's called HTTP 01 validation. But if I'm behind a VPN, you know, something from the open internet can't hit it. Can you not use DNS 01 challenges? Because this only requires you basically to have a public reachable uh, DNS record for that domain and modify that one. A, we don't have a public reachable DNS. Okay. Yeah, so it's almost no, no public. It's almost DNS. air gap. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So I actually um, w I, I tried to do something similar. Well, not similar, but um, I was looking at um, Rancher, um, trying to run it locally with Minikube. They well, is is it that? You want to use um, Let's Encrypt? No, not necessarily. I just want Ingress. Yeah. All right. So take a look at um, how they do their um, Rancher 2. Um, I think it was with um, TLS and Cert Manager. Uh, I think they actually disabled it and used something else to actually do it. I think that may actually steer it in, in the right direction. So you're not doing any, any external validations um, or requests for that. Sure. That okay. That. Yeah. And I mean, in this situation, since it is a very closed ecosystem, why not have your own CA and cert manager itself can be, you know, manage your PKI for you. Uh, yeah. And you, you just need to trust that CA then. Yeah. And, and can you, probably you even use like vault to just uh, have it generate your certs for you. Yeah. Or, I mean, you, yeah. Cert manager itself though can handle that whole uh, process. Uh, and, and we set up basically for cert manager, when we were using KIM, we set up uh, cert manager as a CA, uh, which mm. would then generate the certificates for KIM and it's all self-contained ecosystem then and works and we have TLS. Um, now, that's Let's just face it. There's yeah. no, there's no, there's no nice solution uh, for all of this because of those constraints that you have. But to me, the 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 uh, the your own private trusted yeah. CA is no, setting up that. That sounds like that. That's something I hadn't thought about. Um, setting up cert manager as a as a CA. Um, that that we would just have to tell everyone using it to trust. Um, you know, because Nginx Ingress will create self-signed certificates that are signed as, you know, Kubernetes fake certificate or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Name of their certificate. Um, and you can, uh, like, kind of trust those, but I think they change. Like, they don't kind of stay constant. Yeah, but if you if, redeploy that, Nginx Ingress yeah. would be uh, but if cert, Right, but if Cert Manager can be set up as a stable, persistent CA that I can then say, okay, go trust this CA, that would yeah. work. Yeah, and that would yeah. and that would make it so that I don't have to terminate. Because um, I would I would prefer to avoid having to use ACM and terminating TLS at an application load balancer because it adds a bunch of work yeah. and and overhead. I would rather yeah, just terminate I TLS at uh, at at Nginx Ingress. And, yeah, and then there's, I mean, doesn't uh, AWS has all the private uh, ACM stuff, but I know that's very expensive. I don't know, and I don't know if it's in GovCloud. For what it's worth, I'm doing something similar with the Lambda right now, um, accessing on-prem. We're, we're rolling our own CA. Mm. And then it's okay. just a VP, VPC through like a VPN gateway, like site-to-site -site VPN. And then we're, uh, yeah, we're setting up our own uh, CA. Using Cert Manager, uh, we're using uh, AD, which was out of my control. But yeah, we're using AD to, to generate the certs. Okay. Thanks, Adam. Yeah. No, that's good. That's good info. Thanks. Cool. Uh, any other quick questions? All right, well, let's uh, get into the first talking point then, um, which is gonna be uh, working from home tips. Uh, I'd like to first open this up to uh, Dale, since you, you already shared something on this uh, that you've put together. Um, let me uh, open that up uh, on my shared screen here so we can all see what that's about. <clears throat>
Right. Of course, my corporate firewall blocks Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> is this your setup, Dale? Uh, yeah, it is. That's my work from home setup. <laughs> yeah, it looks like out of Star Trek or something. Uh, it's pr pretty, uh, pretty sweet system. Uh, Only one right. monitor. Get good scrub. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, do you wanna do you wanna must narrate uh, these uh, sure. individual slides? What's going on here? No problem. All right. So um, uh, our office actually um, implemented uh, work from home policy uh, due to the whole. Uh, COVID-19 um, virus. Um, so I pretty much had, had started to put together just a list of things that actually worked for me in the past. I actually um, had worked from home uh, prior to moving to New York um, for approximately eight years. Um, and these are some of the tips that actually worked for me. Um, so even when I got here, one of the first things I actually did was to convert one of the bedrooms into like a little office. Uh, just in case my girlfriend was here, um, then I could actually um, set uh, some boundaries as well in, in front of that space and make it as comfortable as possible. Uh, so I like to be a, a bit more organized in what I'm doing. And this pretty much works generally, even if you're in the office. Uh, so I actually would start off with a, a, a natural list. I do keep maintain like a, a whiteboard to the side as well, but I do keep my book or an iPad just to kind of, kind of keep um, everything structured uh, with that. Uh, for personal stuff, I just use like things and for work related stuff, uh, I use like Atlant Atlassian Jira. Um, and just for everyone else's uh, edification, things is an app. Uh, it's a to-do tracker. It's uh, not just things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's an app. That's for that, yeah. Things yeah. and stuff. So, um, I use a lot of cloud-based applications like everyone um, is more accustomed to doing as well. Uh, so like Zoom, Slack, um, Jira, you know, uh, just to help with the collaboration. Um, or Office um, actually does use, use um, Slack generally um, for pretty much everything, um, notifications, just meetings and so on. Um, we've actually switched over to this thing like uh, Blue Jeans or between Blue Jeans and, and Zoom um, as it suits us. Um, one practice I do um, uh, maintain is getting dressed in the morning. Um, not necessarily getting up in a button down shirt and everything, but enough, just get all of the pajamas, take a shower, morning routines. So you kind of mentally prepare yourself to actually get started. Um, even with that, I tend to like uh, set my desk up, clear things off, um, make sure it's uh, a little bit more organized and get seated, you know? Um, I mentioned earlier about setting boundaries. Um, a lot of times, again, because people think because you're working at home, you're available, um, especially if you have family. Um, setting those boundaries, uh, making sure that your, either like your voicemail actually speaks about your availability times, that kind of thing. Just to make people know. I go as far as in putting like a uh, post-it on the door with my hours of operation. So don't be yeah. scared. I think that's a really good one is setting those boundaries uh, make, and, and then having the conversation with your family so that they know that this is the case, uh, yeah. that things haven't really changed. You just happen to be at home now. Yeah. 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 Um, and for my office space, so this image you, you're even looking at, um, I do maintain them at, at Instagram and I uh, post a lot about my desktop just before that. Um, but. I work with a sit-stand desk um, from Jarvis. Um, I switched from a dual monitor to, to a single um, ultra-wide. I invest a lot of time um, into making that space uh, almost like a replica of what it would be, be like in an office space. Um, with my music, my laptop, uh, whatever things that I, I would need to get things done. So whether I'm in the office or I'm back home, I can still function as I would in either location. You know. I really, I really like these arms uh, for the monitors, so yeah. you can move your screen around and get it up. Uh, especially when you're sitting a lot, having it at the right angle mm -hmm. uh, for your head is going to reduce some of that uh, back pain yes. and uh, stress on your wrists by proper posture. I think that's one thing that's not mentioned enough. I mean, it's not necessarily working from home, but 
the, prompt, the difference between working from home often and uh, the office is you have, if you're not doing it often, you have a pretty bad desk situation and chair situation. Mm -hmm. So uh, pay attention to if you start uh, having pain in your elbows and wrists because you're probably sitting uh, in a bad uh, posture with bad posture. Yeah, I, I currently suffer. I have a slight impingement that I did therapy for, and that was related to uh, yeah. my posture at the desk. I actually um, changed my seat out to like the um, Herman Miller chair, and I will yeah. alternate my position as well just to keep uh, some level of activity. I, I like the uh, the iPad thing. Uh, if you guys have uh, iPad Pros, uh, I'm not sure about the other tablets. I haven't researched it, but the iPad Pros, you can use that as a dual display. Um, uh, I guess in 10.15, it's natively supported, but before that, with Duet, that's awesome. So actually, my screen that I'm sharing right now is an iPad tablet. Uh, so it's a great way to get dual displays, like today, if you already have it. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's very useful, especially uh, to see things at a glance. Um, while I was actually in Jamaica, I actually used it as a second monitor as well. Um, so that kind of um, simulated what I would work like uh, normally, but my whole workflow. Um, the another slide, slide I actually spoke about like taking a walk, um, pretty much taking that break, step outside. Um, a lot of people don't realize that they spend so much so many hours in indoors um they don't get a lot of sun um the body don't produce as much vitamin d which is why you also end up with a, a flu season right um and also it helps for kind of um working through blockers clearing your mind you know just step outside clear your head come back in and go back at it you know uh and then the other thing that i tend to do is to over communicate um, so we'll mm -hmm. actually have check-ins um, as well with like uh, direct supervisors and members of the team. Um, at times, I also keep like an open uh, Zoom session, so someone can actually just jump into it um, and speak to me. I like uh, that. Tip. Yeah. Is that clear? Like, uh, I, I'm actually that's one I'd like to talk a little bit more about. I've been thinking about having as well. Is uh, like for teams probably. Uh, so not company wide, and probably for maybe project related. Uh, what about just having a Zoom room open um, that you can hang out in during the day? You can mute yourself. You can stop the video. Doesn't have to be a, a loss of privacy or any of that. But at least uh, you can quickly hear any water cooler conversation that comes up related to uh, topics on that. Has anyone yeah, else that. that? We have yep. that. Um, I actually implemented it. So we use Google Meet, and every every time someone joins into our like. Um, coffee break room is is this called? Um, it triggers a message in our random Slack channel, and mm. people can just swap in as well. So having this as well made it so much nicer because, like, in the beginning, people were just sitting there in there for hours and nobody was really talking or something. And now, when people join, and now we also have a calendar invite every time at one thirty p.m., um, everyone is invited to join there. So. Yeah, so, so you announce when you, so it's, it's not all day. You have it at a, between specific hours kind of of the day. And the channel is open all the time. Like okay. you can join in there all the time, all day, but like we have like a dedicated session of 30 minutes where you can go in there now. Okay. Right? And, that, and that's what you announced to your Slack uh, team yeah. in a, in a yeah. channel. Okay. Yeah. So we have to keep ours uh, running throughout the day um, so you can just pop in. Cause Normally, even in the office, uh, we'll just tap each other on, on the shoulder, and it also helps as ambient noise. Um, and I guess just mentally, you're just not feeling alone. Um, yeah. So, so that helps. That's a good tip. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and you know, during this whole thing, uh, just wash your hands as frequently as possible and keep safe. And that's it. But I, I do have all, all the tips on my. Um, my Instagram that I just do some little slides about uh, between like Kubernetes, Docker, and working from home, and there'll be more. I can't stress enough that over communicate thing. You took that was one of my notes too, and I think that's a really important one. Is that um, I don't I think it's hard to uh, to over communicate actually, and we, most people are actually under communicating what they're uh, working on. So people are not really informed on what's progressing, where they're stuck, um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Any anybody else have thoughts on that? 
So one of the things my team just uh, recently started doing, and we really like it, is uh, there's an app on Slack called Dixie. Hmm. Um, that is uh, daily asynchronous standups. And you set it up uh, for a particular time, and it sends each member of the team a message saying, okay, it's time for standup. You know, and it asks you the typical three questions, you know, what did you do yesterday? What are you doing today? Do you have any blockers? And um, it has, I think it has helped a lot with um, getting people to write down their thoughts. Because when we're, we do a, we do a stand up call every day also. But uh, sometimes that can just be, oh yeah, I was working on this other thing and I'm still working on it. And that's kind of it. But um, getting them to write it down gets them to go into a little bit more detail. And uh, especially with the blockers portion, uh, it is um, much, uh, it, it, it's much, it's much quicker to get blockers resolved when you write them down in Slack and say, this is a blocker for me right now. Mm -hmm. Someone almost always immediately goes and picks it up. Like if it like, uh, you know, a blocker for me is I have this merge request that's waiting to be approved. And, uh, you know, nine times out of ten, somebody goes, oh, I'll go look at it, you know, because it's right in front of them. I'm curious about this. And, I, I, and there, this is probably like one of the most common app categories almost that I see uh, for Slack. Um, I'm curious about anybody who's been using a tool like this for, say, six months or more. And is still you and still sees at least let's say eighty percent participation um, in the notifications. My my inherent skepticism, based on my own patterns, this is like a confession here, is that anything that is automated that I know is going to happen every day at the same time, I tend to ignore, as opposed to those things that are infrequent. Um, so this is why personally my, I don't have hacks like that set a reminder every day at the same time to do something because then I just end up ignoring it. Uh, any, any, anybody using this successfully in their company for a long time? No, We've only been using, oh, We've only been using Dixie since January, but uh, mm -hmm. I think um, as far as participation, we, uh, our, the messages go out at 11 and we have our standup at 1130 mm -hmm. and most of the standup is going through the Dixie messages. Mm -hmm. So if one of them isn't there, you know, it's, it's instantly, you know, kind of a polite name and shame kind of thing. Why, Hey, why didn't you, why didn't you add your standup, <laughs> you know, gotcha. but it's, Oh yeah, sorry. I forgot, you know, or I got busy or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, we haven't had any issues okay. with people just kind of forgetting about it because, I mean, as long as leadership does it, I think it tends to trickle down. Yeah. Uh, any other, uh, yeah, any other suggestions for working from home? Uh, Brian, uh, any of your own uh, tips or hacks you'd like to share? Uh, or something in particular you were thinking of when uh, you asked the question in Office Hours channel? Uh, I'm, I, I actually, uh, don't have a lot of experience working from home. I oh, okay. go to the office often. Um, I only work from home usually when I'm sick. Um, so mm -hmm. that's kind of the reason why I was asking the question. I do <laughs> like the idea of the copy break though. I'm, uh, I, I, what I do definitely already meant is, is like the office banter that we have at our office. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I think, uh, we're, going to try that, that today. Uh, thanks to you guys' suggestion. Other than that, I realized that I actually am working later into the night. So, um, cause there's not that like, Oh, drive home thing that kind of stops you from working. Um, so I'm trying to figure out, uh, what I can do to fix that. Two things, two suggestions on that, uh, that help me at least. Um, one is uh, making sure you set your office. I mean, so I think developers have uh, some different challenges uh, from uh, managers. Uh, managers tend to live in their calendars and developers tend to 
just be pulled in every direction. So it's sometimes harder to re regiment. But what I was going to say, like for me, on my calendar, having definite work hours to find there so people aren't scheduling your time outside of hours. And then the other one is disabling your Slack notifications on your phone and on your desktop automatically at 5 p.m. or 5.30 or whenever it is you want your workday to stop. Sure, if you happen to be looking at it, you'll see it, but at least hopefully it, it can give you the chance to close the laptop lid at a particular time um, and move on with your day and focus on family a little bit. Yeah, I'd also make a comment like for the mobile apps, like we use Teams internally on our organization and mm -hmm. they actually have quiet hours. Mm -hmm. So we'll go on and, or I personally, like 6 p.m., I just call them, they pretty much get snoozed and I don't see them till the next morning, which could be a good thing or could be a bad thing, but it's definitely helped me uh, yeah. when trying to disconnect. Yeah. Do you guys not use Slack for like uh, uptime notifications and stuff? Uh, the, well, so anything serious like that should be set up with escalation policies, actually, right? So those should be going to PagerDuty or Ops Genie or something like that, so that they escalate uh, using that medium uh, if if it's urgent. But overall, you, like, uh, you can set you can set uh, different settings for different channels too. Yeah, Perfect. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So like we won't we'll have a different like yeah like he's got a channel called alerts. I would totally have different settings for the alerts channel than I would for the general channel or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You can configure those under the settings. Yeah. And if you guys do like an on call rotation, like those are the weeks where I'll never have quiet hours. You know, so just something to think about. Or I've taken advantage of the Teams feature in the mobile app. I tend to leave mine on because my team likes to just, you know, it, it, even when we're outside of office hours, we, we tend to like, you know, we enjoy talking to each other and, you know, we'll put funny memes or whatever that we find. And, and uh, my v, my software VP in particular is a night owl. So he's up, you know, every night at 1030 doing interesting things because he's just one of those brilliant guys that is a manager, but is smarter than I am at technical stuff. And so, like, you know, he'll be up at 1030 posting links to Istio and stuff. And so <laughs> I like seeing that stuff. But uh, and if it, if it gets too much for me at any particular time, I just hit the Slack has a snooze button. You can say snooze all notifications for four hours or whatever. And then that's what I'll tend to do. The other thing is uh, built into OS uh, X is the notifications uh, menu here. You slide up and you have this do not disturb. It's also helpful. You also can just alt click it and then it will unmute unmute. So mm. like all it's options I shall tell. Yeah. Cool. Let's see what other I had, I jotted down some other notes. Oh yeah, one thing that wasn't brought up uh, is uh, whiteboarding. Um, this stuff has gotten really good. It used to be horrible. You know, you see these chicken scratches on the screen that are unintelligible. But if you have uh, a tablet, like an iPad Pro with an Apple Pencil, uh, together with either Microsoft Whiteboard, which is my personal favorite, or uh, Google Jamboard, uh, both of them are free, you can do really good, high-quality whiteboarding um, on these that are re legible uh, by others. And you can then literally just, uh, if you're using Zoom, you can share, uh, share that screen on your tablet. Uh, I would show you an example if it's interesting. Zoom even has fantastic whiteboarding features now. Yeah, Zoom does have pretty good stuff. I would say it's a difference of if this is something you want to persist and work on or collaborate across Zoom sessions, something you want to centralize. Like if you're using Jamboard, I mean, that, that fits into the whole G Suite, uh, you know, uh, Office uh, products. Same with uh, Microsoft Whiteboard. So it's like you can continue to refer back to them and update them over a series of calls if you need to, or even prepare for it before a call. Yeah, and uh, as we see here. <laughs> Let's keep it. You, <laughs> you just mentioned uh, Microsoft Whiteboard and you're on a Mac. I'm just hearing about this for the first time, but I only just see it available for like Windows 10 and iOS. I was curious if you use it on your Mac. Uh, so, so my point, so my point with this, why they're so usable is with a, uh, stylus, right? So I'm using the Apple pencil on that and it's as good as paper for me. 
to write on there. Like the quality of my, I think the quality of my sketches is just as good as if I was doing it in person somewhere. Got it. Okay. I'll just throw this in there. I use uh, Evernote it has pretty nice. I'll do that with the Apple pencil and you can, uh, you can share those uh, sketches. That's true. Evernote has uh, improved their support for sketching as well. So yeah. I haven't, what I haven't tried to do with Evernote is collaborating on the same sketch with other people. I don't know how that is. I know that works well with Whiteboard and Jamboard. Yeah, that's a good question. Because Evernote in general has been pretty poor at collaborative collaboration, real-time collaboration on a single note. Um, I'd always get note conflicts uh, in that case. I uh, gotcha. Hey, uh, silly question, but on the Apple stylus, can you, or maybe it's a software thing, can you change the shape of the tip and the size? Well, yeah, yeah. Well, so that's on the software side. So, okay. uh, so when you're using Jamboard or uh, Whiteboard, you can change it from a pencil to a marker to a highlighter uh, to a pen and uh, different width of all those. They also have grids, so it helps you draw. And they also have... Uh, what do you call it? I forget what it's called, but they'll auto detect the shapes. So if you draw a circle, it'll make it a perfect circle. If if that's a, if you, if you like that. Yeah, it's like snap to whatever snap. Yeah, to, yeah. yeah. There are all other tools you can look at uh, on the iPad uh, Pro. Well, for the iPad itself, uh, like Notability and Flow. If you're really good, uh, oh, Good Notes is another one. And uh, there are all the tools all there. But like, like for sketching, um, Flow is from Moleskin. That does the whole dark red thing as well, and mm -hmm. it does. Not, it actually has that feature you, you just mentioned, where you can draw a circle. It makes a perfect circle for you, as well. Yeah. What I liked about the the Jamboard though is like if you are a G Suite shop, you have everything in one place. Um, Are you guys are you guys performing any interviews during this time, or are you guys going to put that on hold? We are. Well, for yep. remote interviews, we do. I mean, we do remote interviews anyway, so it's not really mess, messing with it. I mean, the the very final one is an in person, but you yeah. know, we could do a remote for that too. Um, you know, the in person is just really. Do they spell? <laughs> you know, do they have good hygiene? I mean, at this point, you've, you've <laughs> talked to them a bunch of times already, so. Yeah. And you um, guys are using like the whiteboard tool, possibly? Yeah, we use all kinds of stuff for, for interviews. Um, we've done some of uh, like coding challenge type stuff, but it's for some reason our legal department is, is giving us issues with that. Yeah. Well. Um, no, well, just an, an announcement. I'm actually, uh, I recently attended my resignation um, at Semaphore. So I'm oh, wow. towards another company. Um, so I'm actually doing our whole onboarding remotely as well. Um, so in the next three weeks or two weeks and two days, I'll be there. Oh, you mean uh, there as an on-site? Well, there is in remote. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. Well, congrats on the, the change. Yeah. Thanks. Interesting times to start uh, remote. Yeah. <laughs> but you've been remote so much, so. Yeah. So, Pierre, I wanted to get to your uh, question here uh, while we have some time. Um, so, uh, we, you, you're pretty much a regular on these office hours or have attended many of them. You've heard our other talks on kind of like uh, the Prometheus architectures. Right, and I also have answered it a couple of times already, but um, yeah. right yeah. now I'm, uh, I'm re-implementing and rethinking like our search companies and we are currently like- Oh, okay. Companies. And so that's why like, is it actually still the best thing to do? Is there something else? that I might, might be or should be looking out for. Um, so right now my idea is like one Prometheus operator per cluster, um, which has like a short-term storage of maybe a week. And then with one with long-term storage, um, which will go into Tainos, which I have never used before. Um, like I have not used it. I use all the time Elasticsearch um, for long-term metric data. Um, 
So yeah, I just wanted to hear feedback on it and uh, yeah, hear what you guys are doing in terms of this. Um, for example, which I really liked with Elasticsearch was um, that I could have roll up jobs that basically would delete um, certain indexes after um, uh, like three weeks, three months um, for different staging clusters where the metrics are not as that important for me for long-term search, but for production, mm -hmm. I really would like to have the metrics available like forever. So yeah. Yeah, oh, man, I forget who it was. Uh, there was a participant. Uh, now this is probably back in December, November. We talked about uh, Thanos. So uh, I don't have firsthand experience on Thanos. Um, and then there's another one uh, competing against Thanos. I forget what it is. Uh, both of them had pros and cons. Um, man, I wish I could find my notes on that in time. Uh, was it Humio? No, no, it wasn't that one. <coughs> Anybody want to fill in while I do some uh, rapid Googling? For what it's worth, um, I took Eric and Andrew's advice on using EFS for Prometheus, um, and that's worked great for us. Um, I, I got also working with like my ephemeral clusters, so. Um, so the EFS is long lived, but the Prometheus operators are uh, could be short lived. Um, okay. Yeah. So. Um, I yeah, now, it's a nice tool. Yeah, the, the interesting have... thing about it, it it buys you a lot of runway, especially since you can provision more and more IOPS as necessary, um, and engineering time and effort is often more expensive than the provisioned IOPS. Of course. Yeah. So, so your mileage may vary and the scale of data you, you guys are dealing with. I mean, if you're Facebook it might be different, um, but for most companies, it's not that intense. Uh, plus when you'd go the tiered uh, approach, the federated approach with Prometheus and you have multiple Prometheus instances with shorter retention, the uh, Victoria metrics was the other one. Um, okay. Yeah. And, uh, and the, the challenge with some of these systems is they, uh, they offload the HA uh, to another system that you still now have to manage. And my, my concern with having a very complex monitoring infrastructure and architecture is then staying on top, of monitoring your monitoring systems. So the simpler this system is, I, I, the, 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 the happier it is in my mental model. Right, so for me, the long-term search is more like for historical data and if something is, basically if the cluster is down, what happened five minutes before that? Like, yeah. that's for what it is actually meant to be. Um, and for alerting, all this stuff that should be in the staging cluster. So this, should, this will stay as simple as possible, but the long-term search should be still there in my opinion. But yeah. yeah. Okay. But Victoria metrics is something new. So I actually have found something that I will look into. So awesome. Thanks for that. And yeah. Yeah, I think I found the original blog post that I think this might have been the one that evaluated compared Thanos with Victoria metrics and the pros and cons of each and a pretty like honest assessment of each one. Um, okay. And the trade offs. So yeah, I'm going to share that in office hours right now. The channel. Thanks for that. Yeah, so I, I shared that as a thread of his question uh, above. I should in case you didn't see it. Okay. All right. Cool. Uh, any other questions related to that or uh, going back to the original talking point or any new questions? It's really uh, open-ended here. Uh, so if, if you haven't joined before, uh, we have quite a lot of people on the call here. If you have any questions, uh, design decisions that you're trying to make in your organization, this is a great chance to get feedback on those. Uh, I'm. I have an abiding interest in any progress Andrew's made with the 
uh, GitLab Helm charts, the like, <laughs> the work, the ones that actually work. Mm -hmm. um, it works fine. It's just complicated. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I had the same experience. Okay. Um, well, complicated, like like all of these different things, you know, like external object. Yeah, they're like there are lots of moving parts that don't necessarily line up. Um, I'd love for somebody to publish. Do you have like, a particular I'm question? So, well, the operator, I want to get the operator to work because um, basically I have, uh, I no longer have access to like unlimited AWS like I used to. So I'm running a sort of cheapo DigitalOcean uh, cluster that like will sporadically bring stuff up and down. So I basically, I guess I just want like a scale to zero <laughs> GitLab server. Um, uh, and I don't have any particular, like, a, you know, like it doesn't have to be any particular object storage or any particular, um, uh, you know, web server. I'm pretty flexible. So if you're not, if you're not going to use like AWS S3, um, GitLab will provision Minio. Yeah. Have you ever used Minio? Yeah. I mean, you know, it comes, Minio is sort of like under the covers of a lot of like little toy projects that I end mm -hmm. up doing. Okay. And that's good enough, I suppose. Um, and we've, yeah, we've been running Minio uh, on our prod cluster, actually. So we, SCIC has this thing called the Innovation Factory. And uh, part of it is, you know, this GitLab um, for people to use because there wasn't really a good centralized Git solution that anyone could, you know, just go in and use. But, uh, you know, it's been in like beta for a year about, you know, because we just haven't had the resources to pour into it to, uh, you know, get it ready for, you know, any kind of a good SLO, SLA. Um, <clears throat> and okay. uh, so we started out just using Minio and we're still using it and it works fine. Uh, it's backed by EFS, no problems, other than the other day, as in like two, like Monday, um, our EFS ran out of burst credits and everything came crashing down. Mm. Uh, like to the point where it would not work at all. Um, okay. So like GitLab was completely unusable. So, but I, all I had to do was go in and up the, and we, we weren't using provision diops at all. And so I just provisioned some IOPS and uh, it was like, it was like a switch turned on. I mean, it was, it was like that. Everything worked again. Um, you know, and it, it's what, $80 a month. That's nothing. You know, that's, that's an hour and a half of my time, <laughs> you know? Um, so totally worth it. I'm, I'm a hundred percent on board with EFS. I, I am not one of the, uh, you know, doubters when it comes to, you know, all kinds of people say, oh yeah, don't run your, don't run your stuff on NFS. Don't run your, you know, database or whatever. And yeah, if you're Facebook, maybe not yeah. the best idea, but we've been running it on EFS. We've been running a Postgres database. We've been running um, Gitily, which is the, the backend service for all your, you know, Git command line for GitLab. We've been running Minio on off of EFS. We've been running Jenkins off of VFS for over a year now and no problems whatsoever. Zero, zero problems. Sweet. Works for me. I, okay. I, uh, I missed the first part there on, uh, where does, uh, GitLab depend on something like, uh, object storage like Minio? Well, mostly for like the, um, repositories. Um, it works and with just a generic object storage. It doesn't require like a you, file system. I can tell you exactly what. It um, means. Yeah, exactly. They do list it um, deep in the docs. But yeah, uh, yeah, um, it'll do. Uh, um, well, you have to tell it what object storage. Oh, uh, the registry. Sorry, that's another important part. Um, oh, so artifacts, backups, packages. Okay. Uploads, makes, registry, and uh, those are all, those all go into buckets, into S3 buckets. You don't have to use S3, you can use Minio, which is this, that you know, open source tool that mimics the API of 
S3. I, I uh, that makes perfect sense when you say that. I was curious how they were doing Git on um, S3 like object storage, and uh, it seemed like it would be a lot of work to implement. Gitly itself does not, uh, which is Gitly is the backend service that does all the Git RPC stuff. When you say you know Git clone whatever, you're talking to Gitly. Uh, yeah. That doesn't use object storage. That just uses a. Uh, it's a in Kubernetes. It's a stateful set backed by a persistent volume claim and that persistent volume claim is in uh, EFS using EFS provisioner. Yeah. Cool. Any additional questions related to this or uh, new questions? Uh, yeah, the Minio, um, <laughs> who are you using exactly? So Minio is a tool, uh, it's M-I-N-I-O, and you can, you know, it's, it's, it's open source. You can go get it on GitHub or whatever. There's a Helm chart for it and everything. Um, and it's a, it's a tool where you can basically host on-premise um, uh, S3 buckets. Uh, I mean, it's S3 protocol, right? Yeah, it's exactly the same API as Amazon S3. So literally, you can, like, you could even you can even use um, something like. Uh, it doesn't require local storage on the R host for it to do with doing obviously, right? So. No, it uses oh, yeah. it uses EFS too. All right, cool. I mean, it's just it all it requires is a persistent volume claim, right, to put things in. Build your own S3 kind of. It, yeah, so, that's exactly what it is. It's build your own S3. But what's cool about it is tools that use Amazon S3, Minio is a drop-in replacement for them. All you have to do is change the URL that it goes to. You know, Amazon S3 is s3.amazonaws.com or whatever. That's Amazon, you yeah. know, that's the URL for S3. If you change it to whatever your, your Minio is being served at, Everything works. It's this. It's all the same protocols. It's all the same authentication. Um, yeah, it, it works great. And my understanding is the architecture of Minio isn't too radically complicated either uh, in terms of components and services, right? So deploying it in Kubernetes with Helm. Uh, Just one pod. Yeah, which is that's pretty amazing. Uh, yeah. Have you looked at OpenEBS at all or anything like that for adding? Some more feature functionality to this whole container-based sort of abstraction layer to storage. I think if I were to get more advanced on storage right now, it would be with Rookseth. I think that's that's tending towards uh, Rookseth is is tending to be the uh, the, the the favorite child right now for uh, Kubernetes. Um, yeah. I'm I'm actually trying to experiment with it with um my Raspberry Pi cluster um uh, with a distributed uh object store as well. But it it seems pretty um straightforward. Um simple enough interface. It looks fun. You're using Rookseth with that or which one which one? Uh Rookseth. Okay. Yeah. So it's got like the external USB drives. Two words. Um <laughs> Uh, into the, the Raspberry Pis and then set that up. Yeah, because Rook will do multiple types of backend providers. You're, you're, you're thinking just Ceph, though. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Rook, Rook and Ceph are two different tools that, uh, and I, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I know how to spell them. That's about, that's about it at this point. <laughs> but, um, since Rook is the CNCF certified or whatever choice it's been around for a while with you. for Kubernetes, then it's going to get the best support compared to things like Gluster, which, you know, most people, when I talk to them about Gluster, they say, oh, don't use that. That's a dumpster fire. Yeah, it's a dumpster fire. Totally. That's the only one I can testify to firsthand experience. Oh, yeah. Anybody have actually a success story with Gluster? I'd like to hear. Yeah. <laughs> well, this open EBS stuff is like becoming pretty popular too. It might be worthy of uh, keeping an eye on. So. Yeah, 
I, I think pretty much if you don't end up using Rook, you end up using um, Open EBS. So either one should be fine. Any uh, any ticks, tips and tricks for using EFS in the large capacity you are? Like, is it sure. better to have one large volume and just like segregate it path based, or how do you manage? Price price wise, it's definitely better to have one large uh, EFS because um, the the amount of IOPS you get is directly proportional to the num to the number of gigabytes of data you're storing. Um, so if you've got, uh, you know, if you've got 10 EFS instances that all have 80 gigabytes in them, the IOPS that you get from each one is tiny. But if you have one EFS with 800 gigabytes in it, you get a lot more IOPS. <laughs> um, and then, of course, you can provision more throughput. Um, so like on Monday, I went and provisioned 20 Mbps, and I think it's probably more than I need. But you're able to change it like once every 24 hours, so I can bring it down. Um, but yeah, it was like 90 bucks, man. That's, yeah, for I a company for that cost spends, one big one would be good, but then you have to worry yeah. about blast radius concerns, right? If all of a sudden a database is going crazy on your EFS volume, other stuff doesn't work so uh, well. So I don't let anyone touch the EFS other than EFS provisioner. No one else has access to it. So the only I things going into that you EFS. If you have a pod deployed using that EFS file system, you might have the noisy neighbor problem. Yeah, yeah, if you're sharing a big one. Yeah. I, like when, when it comes to IOPS, like if you run out of burst credits, is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, Definitely, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the problem we ran into on Monday. Yeah. But as long as you have burst credits, then yeah, you're fine. That's what we, that, that was one of the things that we ran into uh, with uh, Prometheus um, in the early days was uh, we, the volume was so small that we didn't have high burst credits. So we ended up having to artificially, uh, we, well, in our case, we provision more IOPS. I know, uh, Andrew, you've also said you can just write a um, uh, uh, zeros. Yeah, zeros to a file. And, just garbage data to yeah. increase the file size of the, or to increase the, the size of the, the file system. Yeah. Yeah, you can do that too. Um, you you have like, to, you gotta just work out the pricing. Yeah. Which yeah. one yeah. works yeah. better it's for you. It's probably just paying for it and keep the architecture simple than yeah. managing uh, files. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, end up, I didn't do that when it came to actually needing to mm -hmm. fix this thing when it all came crashing down on Monday, I just provisioned more throughput. Yeah. It's kind of like a provisioned IOPS on RDS where it's just more expensive than just expanding the disk size. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. I've actually been considering and <laughs> I, 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 it's going to be a battle getting my team on board because they're, you know, they think RDS is God's greatest gift to humanity. But um, with the way, I'm not, I won't say the industry, but with the way my industry in the government space is going, they really put a premium on making things um, cloud agnostic. Mm. So I've actually been doing, uh, been a lot more interested in, in doing some more work on looking at you know everybody tells me not to run a database in kubernetes but i kind of want to run a database in kubernetes <laughs> so you should look uh, at postdoc sqlite you never lived until you've like upgraded a whole kafka cluster in like a 10 minutes worth of planning and five minutes of execution <laughs> so and but, like hardly any like even a blip of an outage so it does man it feels pretty good that's all i'm saying so well that was before like that was after the ham shots for kafka got released i imagine right yeah i i had heavily customized charts so okay. Jeez, what on earth? this has got all kinds of databases yeah so this is open i've never heard of this before yeah and it's operators for kubernetes to manage these the, the business logic for managing these services on kubernetes Oh, my oh, that's God. awesome. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> well, I, you know, I can't speak from first-hand account. I just know that that's what their uh, prerogative is. 
See, this I don't know what their business that. model is. I'm, I'm, I've looked at their site and I'm just sort of unclear where they're coming from, but they make some really great stuff. So, do pod disruption budgets help? And I mean, can you set them up to like, like cap the amount of data uh, storage access? No, that's more about like how frequently Kubernetes can nuke it and move it somewhere else. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's maintaining stability of the service the, the, yeah. over uh, rebalancing the pods in the cluster. Okay. This is beautiful. I'm definitely going to check this out. Cool, cool. Yeah, I mean, we, we don't run production grade uh, databases in the cluster, but we've had no problem with staging and other stuff in the cluster, so. Why? It's mostly uh, personnel issues. Like we don't have enough time to really understand that system, but RDS is well understood. So more of just a, it's a safety fallback for us. We, unless we can actually engineer that, test it, build it, make sure it works well and actually monitor it and operate it well. It's just not worth, uh, it's not worth the risk to us uh, to not use RDS. Yeah, that's fair. If you've got, if you've got a team of like 10 guys and you can, you can fit that in, like go for it. We, you know, we got three guys and that's not enough. <laughs> yeah. That's a really good point. And it also goes back to the, that wise comment, Chris Fowles, I think said, you know, it, if, you, if you're introducing a software like this uh, and you don't have the resources to manage the life cycle of it, it's going to be in the critical path and uh, be a problem for you. That's my paraphrasing of his succinct statement, which was many fewer words. If you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. Yeah, yeah, more or less. Awesome, guys. So uh, that brings us to the end of the hour. Uh, thank you for sharing uh, all the tips from working from home. Brian, I expect to, uh, you to be hyper productive now during the next two weeks as a result of this. Thanks, everyone, uh, for sharing. Uh, remember to register for our weekly office hours. If you haven't already, go to cloudposse.com slash office hours. Uh, a recording of this call will be posted to the office hours channel, as well as syndicated to our podcast at podcast cloudposse.com so you can subscribe using whatever podcast software you use see you next week same place same time all right guys bye adios